Mr. Speaker, I rise today as a proud adoptee, a son with two loving parents who provided me with all the love and support a child could ever ask for. But yet, I heard in this chamber a few days ago that someone saying my parents aren't real parents. Are you a mother? I am a mother by marriage. By marriage, I see. Um, and and my wife is here with me, so. The problem is, is people like you need to admit that you're just a political activist, not Gentle a teacher, ladies, not a mother, and not a medical doctor. Let me be clear, I am their child, they are my parents, and for bigoted, closed-minded reason, certain folks have decided that people who adopt their children are lesser than. But make no mistake, whether you adopted your child, had biological children, or found your chosen family in some other way, you are a parent. And because I haven't seen any of my Republican colleagues in this chamber condemn these disgusting comments, I hope, I hope that they don't also agree with it. Because I won't allow anyone in this chamber to disrespect my family or yours. And directly to the people who have opened up their hearts and homes to children ready for their embrace, don't let anyone ever diminish who you are. You are real parents, a parent and nothing less. I yield back. I mean, my colleague, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, has said, quote, Christian nationalism is actually a good thing. Yeah, I also call myself a Christian nationalist. And that's not a bad word. That's actually a good thing, right? And there's nothing wrong with leading with your, in, with your faith, because we should lead with our faith. The Bible itself in 2 Corinthians actually warns us against this. Paul warned against this. He warned us against people who would preach of a Christ that differs from the true Christ that we learn about in the Bible. That's exactly what Christian nationalism is doing. I condemn religious extremism everywhere, globally and domestically. We have to recognize the threat it po poses to our most sacred freedoms and root it out everywhere. And I think it's incumbent, especially upon us uh, as Christians, and me, and me as a Christian, to be at the forefront of the fight to ensure that white nationalism and Christian nationalism doesn't see the light of day. It's amazing to me that just in a few years' time, uh, it's now considered misinformation to talk about the Nazis in Ukraine. This is an extremely concerning situation. I don't think anyone in the United States government, Americans, do not support actual Nazis or white supremacists. I know I certainly do not. And I can't understand why in just a short amount of time, this information that our own American media frequently talked about is no longer talked about. Before I get into it, it's interesting to hear my colleague just now talk about disavowing white supremacists, when in 2022, she spoke at an event led by white supremacists and white nationalist Nick Fuentes, and when asked about it, doubled down on it and said, we're going to focus on people, not labels. So get out of here with that damn hypocrisy. And Dr. Snyder, I'm going to give you some time to respond. First of all, I'd like to thank the representative from Georgia by making clear with her comments and with her person that any discussion of political warfare has to include Russia, Ukraine, and America. Um, she's just demonstrated that point, I think, very powerfully. We've got our infamous colleague from Florida, or from Georgia, saying that she, quote, can't wait for mass deportations to start on day one of the Trump administration. And then we have the criminally indicted former president himself saying that he wants to scrap birthright U.S. citizenship. I want to remind everybody that the promise of this country, the promise written on the Statue of Liberty, is one that welcomes all folks who are most vulnerable with open arms, like my mother did when she came here from Cuba as a refugee and asylum seeker. Republicans in the House need to stop lying to the American people, and if you don't believe in the promise of this country or our values, you don't believe in the beacon of hope, which is the Statue Gentlemen, of Liberty. time has expired. Thank you so much, Dr. Snyder. And, you know, this hearing was put together to talk about political warfare, and it's strange because a lot of my Republican colleagues seem to be pointing a lot of fingers, but not at Vladimir Putin and not holding him accountable. I mean, even top-ranking uh, top Republicans are having enough of it. Mike, uh, uh, Michael McCall said, quote, I think Russian propaganda has made its way into the United States. Unfortunately, it's infected a good chunk of my party's base, unquote. We just heard some of that right now. Republican uh, Michael Turner, chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, quote, we see directly coming from Russia attempts to mass communications that there are anti-Ukraine and pro-Russia messages, some of which we even hear being uttered on the House floor. Dr. Snyder, can you just, um, talk really quickly about some of the main narratives Russia uses when engaging in political warfare? 
I, I appreciate this question because there's so, if we're going to talk about political warfare, we have to take into account the, the ways that countries cooperate. It's entirely artificial to say, here's China, here's America. That means that we leave aside um, Xinjiang, at least we leave aside Tibet, Hong Kong, Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, Europe, all the places where China practices political warfare, and we leave aside Russia and Ukraine, which is where it matters the most. Political warfare is only political warfare if it passes through us. That is the intention. We've just seen an example of it passing through a person. Mm -hmm. It's only political warfare if it passes through us. What the Russians and the Chinese imitating the Russians try to do is to convince us that our system is no better than theirs, there's no point in voting, and we should support, if we support anyone at all, the person who's most likely to bring our system down. That's the point. I really appreciate you bringing up the fact that it has to pass through us because we just heard it here from my colleague. And here's another tweet from the same colleague saying, anyone who votes to fund Ukraine is funding the most corrupt money scheme of any foreign war in our country's history. And if you look at where this is from, this is from the Strategic Cultural, uh, Culture Foundation, an online journal run by a Russian intelligence service that has been sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury Department for election interference. So we see it passing through us, and not just with the colleague that just spoke, but with many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And what Russian propaganda won't tell you is most of the money allocated for Ukraine is actually spent in America. 90% of it going to Americans. And so are these American companies that support Ukraine, are these allegations based on evidence, Dr. Snyder? And if not, where do these allegations against President Zelensky and his cabinet come from? First of all, U.S. weapons are being used extremely efficiently on the Ukrainian battlefield. They're being audited in practice. Secondly, there is an American institution which does audit the way that is expended. Mm -hmm. Third of all, you're quite right. What the allocation of usually weapons that are about to be de decommissioned anyway to Ukraine means is that we spend more on modern weapons inside the United States, which is why the defense industry is generally in favor of it. This trope of Ukraine being corrupt with respect to the weapons comes from a handful of Russian sources. Um, there is no reason to think it. They're fighting for their lives. They're doing very well. Yeah, thank you so much. We've got to let that sink in. We have members of the United States Congress using Russian disinformation to discredit Ukraine and help Russia. And um, I yield back. Thank you. Religious prosecution and uh, violent extre extremism globally are very serious threats to U.S. security and human rights abroad. Today, I, on my line, I want to focus in and hone in on religious extremism happening here in the United States domestically because I believe it's also a very important part of this conversation. Christian nationalism is a form of religious extremism making its way into our policies and undermining our democracy. These extremist actors are co-opting the language of Christianity and religious, religious freedom to push an undemocratic agenda that seeks the very opposite of what they claim to do. And I, I want to start off by saying I'm a man of faith. I was raised Southern Baptist. I love potlucks. I was in Awana. I got the Sparky Award. Uh, I was in youth band for about 10 years. This is a huge part of my life and part of the reason why I'm so passionate about it. Um, as a man of faith, I know that Christianity is not Christian nationalism. I oppose my faith being used to whitewash a racist, violent, and dangerous ideology. Ms. Tyler, I have a few questions for you, but let's start with this. How does religion differ from religious extremism, and why is religious extremism, um, specifically Christian nationalism, threaten the safety and lives of people in our communities? Well, I, I think that religious nationalism is this tendency to merge our religious and national identities. And it can occur along a spectrum, but can also be co-opted by those in power to enforce a certain religious viewpoint on everyone else. And that's why it's such an urgent threat to religious freedom. Uh, but it is also, as you point out, an urgent threat to democracy. And it's because it is taking this increasingly violent aspect. And we saw that um, on January 6th and the way that Christian nationalism was used as a permission structure and as a uniting um, ideology for people who were who were here at the Capitol that day in search of a political cause that was then infused with religious fervor. And what would you say the relationship is between white supremacy and Christian nationalism? 
Christian nationalism often overlaps with and provides cover for white supremacy and racial subjugation. Um, that's because the Christian and Christian nationalism is not so much about theology as it is about an ethno-national identity. Yeah, and Christian nationalists have played vital roles in very violent attacks. Even recently, the, the killing of 11 people attending services at the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. The, the killing and murder of, of nine people attending a Bible study at Emmanuel um, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, the Emmanuel Nine. The killing of 33 people um, shopping at Walmart and Tops in El Paso and Buffalo. Ms. Tyler, how does Christian nationalism pose a threat to our democratic institutions? Well, I think all of those examples are what happens when this ideology of Christian nationalism is used by white supremacists to try to justify their violence. It uses the symbols and the language of Christianity to try to justify what is indefensible. And it turns, again, their hatred into a religious cause, into something that they believe is ordained by God. But most Christian nationalists claim to support religious freedom while at the same time working to, to uh, have the exact opposite of that happen. Have you noticed a coordinated attempt in America to co-opt the right of religious freedom to try and justify stripping rights away from people? Well, I do think that language really matters here in definitions. And too often, we hear the language of religious freedom being used for what is really religious privilege or Christian nationalism. True religious freedom requires equality for all people, regardless of religious belief. And that's why it's so important, as our Constitution promises, that the government will stay neutral when it comes to religion to allow all religions to flourish.